So Alexandra, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and being willing to share your story. Um, where can people find you? Where can they reach out to you and find more of your work before we get into that? Uh, people can find me on my YouTube, on Instagram right now, uh, Chasing the Bagua. Uh, Bagua is B-A-G-U-A. Uh, and then I also will be having uh, some more stuff out soon. So do check out Chasing the Bagua and you'll see my new stuff as well soon. That's great. And then for your convenience, everyone listening, I'm going to link everything below. So you'll be able to find all those links really, really easily. But so, Alexandra, what brings you to the channel today? Like, how did you get involved in the occult and then ultimately find Jesus Christ? What did that process look like for you? Ooh, well, I was definitely, you know, called by the Lord at a time of darkness and a time of confusion. And I'm just very grateful for our Lord, our creator, um, to really hold truthful and steadfast and you know everything is ordained and and truthful in the bible that is god's word and i really had a hard time believing that uh my whole life uh as i was in occult practices since i was a kid you know eastern philosophies and things like that um both my parents had been raised catholic uh, which has its own rituals and um, ideologies within that. Um, but my father definitely had a lot of um, new age practices. He uh, studied the Course of Miracles, which is one of those uh, prominent, um, you know, heresies. And, uh, you know, my mother did well, both my parents uh, were involved with some tarot, more for, I think, game or fun. Um, but I definitely took that and studied. And I, I, I'm an autodidact. I, I love to go into subjects and um, dissect them and understand them. So I ended up, uh, you know, in my 30s, really becoming a professional astrologer and tarot reader um, after being in you know, a long stint of Eastern philosophy, I would say. So, um, and my full testimony is on Chasing the Bagua um, on my YouTube channel. But uh, basically, I was going through a spiritual attack. Uh, it's interesting, you know, that the New Age talks about spirituality when, and I thought I was a spiritual person doing all these practices but it wasn't until I knew the Lord that I actually realized what is true spirituality. If you're not with Christ, if you're not with the Lord Jehovah, then it is demonic practices. So, you know, tarot, astrology, um, you know, diving into these occult practices, sorcery, magic, all, you know, spells, all those things. Uh, I was really shown um, that are, are just an abomination, as the word says. So, and, and I saw it firsthand because I um, was, as some people say, channeling, uh, like spirits were, you know, and this happened with my astrology practice. So sometimes I would be, um, you know, going into my charts and all of a sudden, you know, people call it downloads or channeling. And the Greeks actually had a uh, idea of this too, that they got their thoughts from an entity. So, you know, we can see that there too. Um, and in the Bible, these are called familiars, right? You stay away from the familiars. And so, yeah, I had a firsthand experience with that and it was trying to confuse me. And um, long story short, uh, the Holy Spirit showed up in my room. It was a multifaceted sheet of light and it spoke Jehovah to me um, during a time of confusion and just covered me with absolute peace, which is what the Bible speaks of. Yeah. And so you've got such a level of depth and knowledge in these particular areas. And I know that you were even doing it at one point as a business, you know, you're a professional, I suppose, in that regard. And I'm wondering, 
what sort of experiences did you have with uh, things like astrology and tarot? And maybe you could define some of those terms for people that are watching that aren't familiar with what astrology looks like. And perhaps then we could get into how you look at that now since you've been saved. Yeah. So I've always had a background in astrology since I was a little kid, really. Like it's, you know, palmistry. I read the lines on your hands. Um, And I would also read charts. So astrology, um, you know, there's different ways that you can do it. But if you look into history of the people that actually did astrology, um, the Chaldeans, um, the, um, you know, uh, Indian uh, astro- Vedic astrology, which leads into Hinduism with the many gods. If you follow this historically, these were people that denied the true living God. And I didn't know that when I was practicing, like God revealed this to me. So basically what astrologers do is they take a snippet, uh, like a shot of, of time. And th- that's where those planets, you know, God put the planets in, you know, in orbit and they're there. And Revelation talks about, you know, the things that will change as well when, you know, and during the end days. So we can't even rely on that because God has also told us the truth about the future. Um, So basically astrologers will take this snapshot of a time period, um, basically like your natal chart, the time you were born, and then predict things off of that. And there are some things that, you know, I was a predictive astrologer and some of these things come true, but there are snares within this, which I noticed actually after I quit astrology for a while, which I think you'd find this fascinating is that once I was away from it for about a month, it was almost like a, a substance was I was it was almost like I was going through like uh, releasing alcohol or you know a drug out of my life because it actually was it was morphing my mind a certain way and we are supposed to rely and trust in God you know not like there is that verse do not rely on your own understanding so why are we relying on the understanding of other people who are essentially being directed by demons that's that's what was revealed to me absolutely so what i'm hearing you say is that people are looking to the stars particularly around when you were born and then they're trying to figure out the future from that right it's like a form of divination i suppose and so one of the things that i'm curious about is i think that the devil often likes to mix in a bit of truth and then like you say that can kind of ensnare people and so i'm wondering in the world of astrology and tarot and things like that did you think like what do people that are practicing in those spaces feel like they're getting out of it? Are there any like real world benefits, even if it is uh, uh, something that's condemned in scripture? How do we look at it objectively as Christians? I now coming out of it for five months, I don't see any benefits. The only benefit would be demonic because it, it actually, you know, the Lord is not the author of confusion. But what I, I did notice um, is that it caused a confusion or this insatiability to have more knowledge, right? And and so when the Lord opened my eyes to the truth and the absolute truth, I actually didn't need to search for more information, which mm-hmm. was like another part of that piece. So I think it, it is a very big lie. And going back to how I almost perceived it as I was getting off of a substance addiction is that you don't even know because it's a mental overload. It's not this physical thing. So it actually is very dangerous because you can't even really conceptualize it. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I'm following you. And so then with the experience you had around tarot, and I know that started really young for you, um, growing up in a sort of a Catholic background, like we were discussing before we even started recording, 
With the tarot cards, is that sort of a similar uh, goal behind that? Is that to do with uh, understanding the future? Is that understanding yourself? And how do you view tarot cards now as a Christian, as someone who used to practice that professionally? Well, um, it was funny, like after I was saved, you know, maybe the first couple of weeks, I was sitting, having some tea and these young women had their tarot cards and it was just so, you know, so clear to me that they were searching for truth in the wrong place places and and you know the devil will be like um how do you say he will show up as an angel of light right yeah. so we think it's a concept that's good and so tarot you know maybe can can give us some people <laughs> non-believers can give them some comfort in a direction to go you know if they're feeling lost or it's like a a little band-aid for um what they're dealing with in life but they're i mean we're actually i mean coming out of all this i just realized how big this spiritual warfare is and if if you don't know that you're in it you're already um, you know, you're already being subdued to it. You'll, you're shackled and chained. And, and so tarot itself is, I want to say like 52 cards, I think, you know, um, and there's been so many different, uh, different types of cards of divination throughout the years. The toss tarot deck is, is very big, which was Alice, Alistair Crowley, which has a lot of uh, satanic um, like under notes and, and things like, I mean, if you go in the history of all this stuff, it is really dark and we accept it here in our culture in modern day, you know, uh, either America or Austria, wherever we are in the world, we're, we're accepting these new age practices because we don't even know where the roots are. And I don't, absolutely know it with tarot itself but you you have these pictures that basically tell a story and and as a practitioner as either an astrologer or a tarot card reader you're you're really just coming up with conclusions that it could be and you're throwing out shots of what it could be you don't really know but you have like a kind of prescription of so many different outcomes and you throw it out to your client and then it speaks to them. And it is, I mean, it's, it's just getting them more lost. Only the word of God is going to give you that happy marriage, give you the happiness within and the peace and the strength to endure anything that comes today or tomorrow. Um, yeah, to me, it's just, it is really amazing and how, how convoluted things are in our present day. Um, and with what happened with me, with doing Vedic astrology, um, if you watch my full testimony video, I had a deity's name that popped into my head like I channeled it or whatever that I never heard about. His name is Ishvara. There's many deities in Hinduism and I never heard of this before. And it just have, having come out of this, I just, I mean, it is so scary. I was, I was studying Sanskrit when this happened. I ran away from it because it, is it's just so scary and and dark like i i can't even really explain that or express that any further um yeah i i wouldn't suggest any christian to give their time to any of these practices and yoga including because i was a practitioner of yoga for about 12 years i studied it you know, I quit yoga also. So I was studying the whole body of these Eastern philosophies, the language. I was studying the healing science, Ayurveda, which they say is light science. 
So you go back to, you know, how Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, and then we see this false light and you get intoxicated by it. And it really, I mean, is destroying souls. It, it, it is just, and that's why I'm just grateful that, you know, we linked up and I can, I can share this and hopefully help other people understand the, um, you know, what they're putting themselves in danger of doing these practices. Yeah. And I found what you said really interesting about how you're sort of layering your own interpretation upon the tarot deck to a certain extent, right? Because whenever we discuss things like this on the channel, there's inevitably people that are a little skeptical of these practices. And I'm skeptical of them as somebody that acknowledges that there's a spiritual reality behind them, right? And that's why I think that they're dangerous. But I think what you said about how you experienced the uh, the name of this Hindu deity popping into your head without having ever heard of them before. To me, that points to like this very real but very dangerous spiritual reality that's actually behind these practices. And I'm I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more as someone that's been in that business. Do you think that the majority of people that are practicing things like astrology and uh, tarot are they charlatans? Like, are they just trying to trick people and take their money, or are they people that are sincerely communicating with uh, a dark spiritual world? Um, but they're under the impression that they're helping people. How do you understand that? I think there's a mixed bag there because I know for myself, I came out with the intention to help people and, you know, and what the path to hell is paved with good intentions. That's true. But, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, so I know for my, myself, like I, and I, I did do predictions and I think that's also the scary thing about it is that some, some of those things can make you think that it's everything or you can idolize it also, you know? So there's another place where somebody with good intentions could get lost in that sauce, you know? Um, I think there are some that are complete charlatans. Um, I, I do think that are, there are people that are capitalizing off of that. Um, but either way, I, I just know it's things to stay away from. Um, I, I think some people are just so lost. And, and then you think of these people that have um spiritual what do they call them they're um like their spirit guide right that's another way of saying th however they're getting this information that channeling that familiar that's a spirit guide is that familiar you know and ultimately that is not of god so these people could be completely confused and in the dark about it but then there could be some people that are consuming that and and living off of that and wanting to it's like we talked about that too you know we're both we both play bjd we both do that sport and um you can either train the spirit or the flesh whether you're a believer or not and you know some some people are just insatiable with the flesh and and i think as christians we need to you know be very mindful um about about that in our walk yeah absolutely another thing that i'm interested to hear about because i know you mentioned channeling a little bit in, in the context of your story is i find that a lot of the people that i speak to that come out of the occult they view any sort of spiritual experience that they have as something that validates their worldview like in other words if something supernatural happens they think they must be on the right path because like how could they not be on the right path if all these things are happening around me and like, I can completely understand how you would come to those conclusions as somebody that doesn't have the Bible, that doesn't have a Christian worldview. And I'm wondering a little bit about the sort of supernatural experiences you had uh, in your life prior to coming to Christ and how you understood those at the time and whether or not they informed your worldview in any particular way. Whew. It's a pretty time. big question. Yeah, sorry. But <laughs> we do have time, actually. We've got a lot of time. So please feel free to go into that as much as you'd like to or feel comfortable doing that. 
Yeah, well, honestly, um, you know, in 2008, I had a very big uh, spiritual experience. I can't say, you know, as a, a martial arts practitioner, I've always had this understanding to not connect to phenomenon, you know, through like going in to anyways, <laughs> I've been a lot in the Eastern philosophies, but, um, so I had an experience in 2008, I was living in New York and I was diagnosed bipolar, but what happened to me at this point, and I, I can't, I can't say it was a definite thing, but I, you know, that it was like, it was God revealing this to me, but I do know, you know, because I, I know I was going through a spiritual attack with that, but I also know God had chosen me from the foundation of the earth and or for before. And he also, that experience helped me with me being saved in 2022. I know that for a fact. So, you know, I, I mean, th what happened in 2008, you know, I was drinking and I was living in New York. I think my father had just died, you know, not too long ago. And so, and I was about 22 years old. So I was, I was just going through a lot, you know, and, um, but if you are, if anybody's uh, familiar with Eastern practices, yoga and, and, you know, um, things of that nature, you've heard the word Kundalini, which is what they say is the serpent energy, which like now as a born again Christian is wild, you know, yeah. the serpent energy, at the base of your spine that connects to your head anyway. Whew. But um, so I had, if you look at Kundalini rising experience, I had that. Okay. I didn't know what it was at that point, but I'm not here to say like, I mean, that was a demonic attack. Like the spiritual realm is real and the things that the only way that we can protect ourselves through it is with the word of God. That is literally, and I didn't know that, um, but I also know the Lord had his hand on me and was protecting me and sh it showing me and bestowing knowledge on me for what happened in 2022, because I had this experience where this bright light, which if you look at Kundalini awakening, it's described like this. So I had a experience where this bright light rose from the my sacrum um and all the way up to the top of my head and I was like in this light in my head and um I oh my battery is dying um I can plug it in though um that's cool yeah but I honestly I gloated I, there was all this, it was a very powerful experience. And I just, I remember it. And that was the thing that made me lose my mind, basically. You know, really? can you elaborate was on that? that? I, yeah, I had this, I was boastful. You know, in the Bible, it says to only boast in the Lord. I was yeah. boastful in myself, in my spirit of this energy that was happening within me and and so after coming out of this experience and also at that point i knew there was a presence of god again you know this was a long time ago it was a spiritual experience and i'm not saying i, I don't really honestly know what all was happening there you know um spiritual realm is real but you know, we're mere humans. Yep. And, um, and I started prostrating myself. I'd lived in a Muslim country for about three months. And I'd seen that but I'd never actually partaked in those practices. But when this happened to me, it was like, something overtook me that I had to humble myself before it. So I mean, maybe that's, and that was also when I had my first bipolar experience. So maybe it was like a demon 
infiltration. I don't know. But that, yeah, that happened. <laughs> so, it, but there were positive things about that because, you know, I was cleaning up my life. And then at the same time, it always gave me this mark on my mind to keep myself humble all the time since that experience. And so when I had the Holy Spirit show up in my room, it, like, I was so grateful I'd had that experience before to know to stay humble. Like, you know, yeah, it was, it was very profound. Yeah, absolutely. And I love your humility in even just discussing that. Cause I think that the Bible speaks to so many different things, but I think especially when it comes to the issue of mental health and the, how the spiritual realm interacts with that, we need to exercise a certain degree of humility and say like, we don't have all the answers exactly how that overlaps and what that looks like. And so I love that you're willing to uh, share your experience and be humble about that. And yeah, the Kundalini awakening thing, that seems to be pretty big uh, in the new age movement. What do you think opened the door to that experience? Like, were there certain practices that you were involved in that really led that to happen? Or like, how do we avoid that? Obviously, that's something we want to avoid. You know, I didn't even know about Kundalini when that happened. Like it wow. changed my life to where I was like, you know, mental health. I had to work on my mental health mm -hmm. and I needed to do it without these prescriptive drugs. And, you know, I had to do it. Um, so I, so I gravitated to the East during stuff, you know, meditation and, um, just, you know, doing juice fasts and like I progressively from that point in my life have just continued to get more healthy all around, um, which I think, you know, imbalances, like I, I was drinking, you know, um, so substance imbalances, but also the food that we're eating, the sleep schedule. Um, and honestly, you know, just to be very candid with my own personal experience, um, was that I started writing poetry again. I honestly, I, so that, I think it stimulated something within my, my mind or, but I think the major point that I could give anybody uh, about this is the humility and the humbleness, you know, um, living in a, a very flesh driven society we're always wanting to level up or make ourselves this, or if I do poetry, yeah. Oh, I'm going to do this, this, and this to get there because me, me, me. So if we can just dial it back and look earnestly at the word of God, like, I mean, that's the only way of peace and spiritual splendor and not in this egotistical way but the only way you save your soul like wow you know my whole life's been flipped like really and i just i just pray for everybody in darkness um you know that that we can just come to the knowing of our lord jesus christ because he truly came here on earth and died for our sins. Amen. And amen. And and we just, and it's so sad. Like, I mean, I thought about this other day too. It's like God has gone through this period where he doesn't speak to us. You remember, like in the Old Testament times, he was speaking to them, you know, like speaking to people. And, and now after you know, Christ um, has brought a way of redemption for us. Like we really need to take this time to go into the word of God. Like totally. this is the only way. So, yeah. Totally. I don't know. Cause I know you've been a Christian for about five months now. I don't know if you've had the opportunity yet to read through Daniel. So like, I don't want to put the, you know, like uh, you on the spot here, but one of the parallels that I see in scripture, as you're discussing this, and I think you'll find this really cool if you do get around to reading it is is the this idea of Nebuchadnezzar being reduced to madness because he exalts himself, right? He's like, 
look at Babylon and Babylon. I'm actually preaching from Daniel in a couple of weeks. I've really been thinking about Daniel lately and Babylon is like this ancient superpower, right? It's like, he's like the president of the United States of America, basically. Like he's the most powerful man on earth and he looks and he exalts himself and he's like, look at what I built, look at what I've done. And he sees himself like a God. And then Yahweh um, humbles him, right? Like the one true God humbles him and he ends up living like an animal, you know? Um, and we see all throughout scripture in the New Testament too, that God opposes the proud and he exalts the humble, right? And Jesus is born into a stable. And so hearing you address that topic of humility, I think is like profoundly biblical. And I think it's an example of, yeah, God's spirit sanctifying you. And, you know, another thing perhaps that we could talk about, and we didn't really plan on talking about this, but I think seeing as we're both really interested in martial arts, I myself have done kickboxing and jujitsu for years now. And I know that you've done, you've also been involved in a number of different martial arts, but the world of martial arts is to an extent in certain contexts linked to the occult, right? And so Christians have for a long time sort of tried to figure out how do I navigate practicing martial arts? Like is boxing okay? Is is Tai Chi okay? Like where do you draw the line? And I'm wondering if you could speak to that at all. Like as someone that has a, a faith in Christ, has a background in the occult and a love for martial arts, how do you reconcile all those things? Do you have any advice to Christians out there? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, I, I, had been doing you know my tai chi form for a long time i i don't do it as much i i do wing chong you know because it's human form so there's also these things like when you look at the martial arts there's animal forms and some are human form and you know even in the bible there um because even jujitsu comes they had it in the ancient greek in ancient greece um as well you know um so and, and this is for survival for humans. And, and so not necessarily saying in 2023 that we're going to survive with our jujitsu because yes, there are people bearing arms and all these things. But um, one thing that I love about the martial arts is that it keeps me in a, a place of awareness and alertness. Um, and I think that's something that is uh, really positive thing that you can actually strengthen your spiritual walk as a Christian. Um, and so just to reveal, I guess, you know, my new entrepreneurship too, is going to be, you know, my personal training. And I, I want to have some martial arts that is Christ centered as well, which is called of spirit, not flesh, because we want to be training that spirit and not the flesh. Like we're not going into the gym to try to conquer the other person. I, you know, and there are people that are training like that. And that is very fleshly. So I, I think it's really cool how the martial arts kind of gives us a, a basis, a physical basis to see the spirit working. And I think that's a very positive thing that Christians can take from the martial arts. You know, I think also, you know, with our own discernment and of course we all, you know, all believers have the Holy Spirit residing in them. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to convict us, is going to show us if this is right or wrong. And, you know, maybe if, if we're training a certain style, um, one day we are going to be convicted of that system. Um, so I, I think that's where I am in my present walk with that. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can add to that, I think I've had those sort of experiences in my own life where, and I think it depends a lot on the martial art too. Like when I was doing Kung Fu, it was like a lot more closely linked to Eastern spirituality. Like there was a very tight link between Wushu, which is the style that I was doing and things like uh, Tai Chi and like it drifted into that Eastern mysticism element. Whereas I think things like Western boxing, Western uh, wrestling, jujitsu and Brazilian jujitsu specifically are like quite, uh, although some of the techniques go back to ancient times, a lot of it's very modern. And at least at my jujitsu gym, I don't find that there's a massive overlap between the practice of jujitsu and spirituality in general. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like that at every single gym, 
And I think you can almost think about it like yoga, you know, like stretching is not wrong in and of itself, right? But it's when you're following the system that exalts Hindu deities that that's dangerous, right? Like, so I don't know. I don't yeah, personally exactly. see exactly. Exactly. Like, I think intention plays a massive role, you know, like, so I don't personally see how jujitsu could be spiritually harmful. But like you say, I mean, at the end of the day, I do believe that the Holy Spirit will play that role of conviction in the believer's life um, as it relates to those kinds of things. Um, yeah. And I, I agree with you, uh, where I train and, you know, since I've been training, uh, Brazilian jujitsu, I haven't seen it with spirituality at all, especially in the States, you know, training Muay Thai, of course, I think there's more of that spiritual basis. Um, especially if you go to Thailand, you're going to, you know, see that that's also a very pagan place, but also I wanted to, this was something I hadn't, I I've thought about, but didn't think we were going to speak of, um, you know, being an ex astrologer, one thing that um, was very important to me was seeing timelines. You know, I also study language um, as well. And so that helps me see timelines. And I, I find it fascinating. I thought about this because you brought up Wushu, um, because there's something very dynamic that you can see with Wushu that you can't see in the other arts. And, and this is just speculation. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but, um, but, you know, the wise men came from the East, right? And so when we look at the, the timeline, I'm very interested in like, you know, delving into this just for my own self or, you know, because martial arts language is going to give us a picture of that as well. I really think there was a type of spiritual battle that happened within that time period, like after around when Christ died, you know, I'm even reading about, you know, the roots of jujitsu right now. And um, so that's just something that is very interesting to me um, as well, because in 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 the past before firearms which what when was that the 1500s i think um before that it was mostly swords and and hand to hand combat you know um so i i i know that there is practical purposes for this and it is not just you know piled into paganism <laughs> you know so again mm. there's a lot of of discernment and and practical purposes for it both on a spiritual and physical level for believers you know we just have to practice our discernment i think with that yeah absolutely and i mean again like i hate to keep bringing up daniel but that's just where my mind is right now and you know daniel's in this this part of the world where everybody's practicing the occult you know what i mean he's like he's in a ancient babylon so like He's surrounded by mystics. He's surrounded by people that are practicing, practicing sorcery and divination. And yet he still remains faithful to God in that context, right? He has his eyes set on God and he is uncompromising in his in his loyalty to Yahweh. And I think during my time uh, at, I think what Americans call seminary, we call it Bible college here in Australia. I think I learned, a, a, I sort of learned away a lot of the supernatural elements of the Bible. And I think that I actually made a mistake in doing that recently. Um, the late Michael Heiser wrote a book called uh, The Unseen Realm. And that sort of helped me as as a Christian to really see that for the biblical authors, right? Like the people who wrote the Old Testament and wrote the New Testament, the spiritual realm was so real. Like God was in this place where he was genuinely uh, sovereign and over all of these other false gods, but there were real spiritual entities that the ancient Israelites were worshiping, you know, instead of Yahweh, like the idolatry that you see or when Moses goes to Egypt and then there's this battle between him and Pharaoh's magicians, you know, like these are real things or in the book of Daniel, when uh, Daniel receives the visit from the archangel and he's like, Hey, I was caught up fighting the Prince of Persia, right? Like another power and principality. And so uh, as you read the book of Daniel, you'll see that you'll see Daniel and Daniel's God at war with these other false gods. And I think to me that points more and more to the reality of these practices, the danger behind these practices, but also the fact that God calls us to live 
in especially in the west what's becoming an increasingly pagan age and we can do that in a way that's faithful to him if we rely on him if we use his word as our standard you know to put our trust in christ and his work on the cross is it's just so so important but to be in the world and not of it right to be people who are reaching people in these movements is so important and I'm wondering now, as we start to wrap up, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to say to people before we sort of wrap up this podcast? There was something about, um, oh, yeah, the the Babylonians. Um, there is a type of astrology that is from Babylonian, <laughs> Babylonia, you know, like, I mean, it's just so now that you know god's revealed the truth to me it is just so historically backed up that the people that have created this because that's another thing that people argue is that the lord created astrology Mm. but he didn't there's no i mean just every truth is in the word of god like you know and and then you can see historically that these were people that were pagan turned themselves away from the true living God. So it's very, very clear. Um, and I would just, you know, um, warn people to guard themselves against these practices and not to allow them to get a foothold, you know, because the evil one is, you know, what walking around like a prowling lion waiting to devour and any little inch which is also another positive thing of you know um training jujitsu you know every little inch matters <laughs> you know? yeah, so, does. yeah so don't allow anything uh, that you can you know as long as we focus on the lord and be in the word that's our armor and you know, it is, it is a real spiritual battle out here. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And yeah, I've seen people make the arguments that, you know, because God establishes seasons, right? Like we can look at the stars, we can see that crops grow in certain seasons and, you know, God has ordered the universe in a certain way, but that still doesn't mean that he's encouraging us to practice these arts of divination. And I think like one key text I'm going to read right now from the CSB is Deuteronomy 18. Uh, where God specifically like addresses everything that we're talking about today. And so I just thought that a fitting end to the podcast might be to sort of just look to God's word. And he says this, he says, when you enter the land, the Lord, your God is giving you, do not init- do not imitate the detestable customs of those nations. No one among you is to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire, practice divination, right? Which is everything we're discussing right now. Tell fortunes, interpret omens, practice sorcery, cast spells, consult a medium or spiritist, or inquire of the dead. And then he actually uses really strong language, you know, and he says, everyone who does these acts is detestable to the Lord, right? And that doesn't mean that they're beyond redemption and that they're beyond salvation, you know, like people involved in the occult, like we love people in the occult. That's why we have these conversations and we try to reach people. But uh, it does mean, I think, and your life demonstrates that, that we have to turn our back. We have to repent and move away from those practices. And so thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing your testimony and being willing to expose all of that and, and to be so vulnerable. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.